very few. That's a little sad. It's nice to have live people in the audience. Well, some is better than none. So as I said last time, so first I remind, although at least the people who are here or on Zoom obviously know that the new hours of the course for the last two weeks, so this week and next week, are Monday and Wednesday. So today and day after tomorrow and then next week from 2 till, well, I'll write it European style, 15, 14 to 15, 30. So 2 to 3, 30. And I'll talk either all four lectures or three out of the four on the same subject because it's very pretty. So the subject for either the rest of the course or almost all of the rest, if I finish early, I have one other topic. Subject is the circle method. in a less standard uh, context. So the original circle method I talked about a little bit uh, in the, at the very beginning of the course. And of course, it was made famous and really discovered by Hardy and Ramanujan to study the partition function. And in their famous paper, they mentioned another problem, which is more general, which is partitions into powers, like into squares. So in how many ways can you write n? as a sum of squares of integers where the order doesn't matter. And they gave a very rough answer for that. So they did look at it, but not in detail. But basically, they said it would be very hard to get really detailed information because the corresponding function is not a modular form, which it is in the case of ordinary partitions. So I worked on that. Uh, somebody had asked me a question about that, and I started working on it uh, about a year ago. And uh, it turns out you can say a lot of nice things. But the circle method is already the second stage. As you know, the circle method means you want to get asymptotics of the coefficients of a, of a power series. And you do that by writing a Cauchy integral. But for that, you have to know the singularity, so the behavior of the function itself near maybe Q1 on unit disk or maybe all roots of unity. And so there are two parts. One is understanding the function at uh, near 1 or near all roots of unity. And the second part is the actual circle method. So all of today will only be the first part and probably most or all of, of Wednesday also, because actually that's the most fun part, is understanding the behavior of this function, which is not modular. And there are a lot of nice surprises, some nice number theory, some nice asymptotics. So it's a very good, uh, you know, it, it fits very well with the spirit of this course. So as I say, the, the problem will be specifically the, the squares, but the circle method itself will only come into play uh, uh, fairly uh, 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 fairly late. So maybe next time, more like the next Wednesday. I should also mention the name uh, Fabio Novaes, whom I don't know personally. He's in Chile. But about a year ago, he sent me an email asking if I knew or if anything was known about the asymptotics of the number of representations of a number as a sum of squares, which came up in connection with some problem on the, I have to even look because I don't remember, the turn simons formulation of 3D gravity and its connection to integral systems, nothing of which I know anything about. And so first I gave a very vague answer, it's something very sloppy, but then I got hooked and started working. So I would like to thank him at this point for having uh, pointed out this problem, which was 100 years old. It was a, a known problem. It's discussed in the paper of Hardy Ramanujan. But apparently, nobody had ever studied it in any kind of detail. So I'll start uh, a little historically. So the original paper of Hardy and Ramanujan, the famous paper that I talked about at the Ramanu Ramanujan day, or Ramanujan maybe uh, 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 three weeks ago, just before this course started. So that paper was 1918, and it's called, if I remember, Asymptotic Formulae in Combinatory Analysis. So I'll write that because it's such a famous paper. I don't remember if it's combinatorial or combinatorial. Both words are used. But they had combinatorial, that's what I thought. 
And so, of course, the original problem is P of n is the number of partitions of n of n. So that means you write n equals, you know, let's say, a1 plus some a nu, where the a nu are positive integers. Uh, but up to order. So you, you can put them in decreasing order, or you can consider it up to order. So that's the number of partitions. And then this, was, this function was invented by Euler, who also then promptly invented generating functions and realized that the right way to do it is to look at the function that's called p of q as the generating function without any factorials, just the straight generating function of the p of n, q of n. And then he saw that if you ask how many ones there are, how many twos there are, and so on, you've written n as 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2. So the sum q to the power 1 plus 1 plus 1 with the variable number of ones is 1 over 1 minus q. And the similar thing for the sum of squares would be q squared and so on. So what you get is the infinite product, m from 1 to infinity. So this is in Euler's original formula. And now, as I've already suggested, the key point is that this function a to q, if you, p of q, if you think of q as e to the 2 pi i tau, with tau in the upper half plane, then up to a simple factor, q to the 1 24th, this is a modular form of weight minus a half. And that means it transforms in a completely known way under the modular group. So the modular group tau maps Uh, to a tau plus b over c tau plus d, where a, b, c, and d are us usual are integers, so we're in SL2z with determinant 1. And in particular, infinity goes to a over c, which I could call cap, it's some rational number, well, it might be infinity itself. And uh, conversely, any rational number can be written as a over c, where a and c are co-prime, then they're unique up to a common sign. And then if you have a and c, you can, f you can fill in this matrix a, C, you can find a B and a D, not unique, making the determinant 1. And so you can uh, move from tau equals uh, infinity to any rational point. But that means that if you take Q as always as E to the 2 pi i tau, which I will always abbreviate by E underline of tau because it's too much trouble to write and it's easier to read the formulas, then you see that this would correspond to Q equals 0, whereas this one would correspond to Q is E of kappa, which is... Uh, in this case, is C through of unity. So mu C, double mu C is the set of, or the group of C throughs of unity. So in other words, on the unit circle, we have Q going to one, but you can also go with Q to minus one, or E of a third, or E of two thirds, or E of a quarter, which is I, and so on. So, but because of this model transformation behavior of P, if you know how the function looks at q equals 0, so of course when q is infinity, oh sorry, when, when tau goes to infinity, that would be q equals 0, which is therefore here. So this point is equivalent with all the points, all the rational points of the roots of unity on the unit circle. And since you know the expansion of the function at 0, you also know it to all orders at all roots of unity. But for the functions we'll be having, it's not going to be like that. So now, if we go back to that paper, already in the introduction, they said that one could look at other problems, not just this problem. And in particular, they use the letter S, so I'll also use the letter S. For the moment, S will be a positive, strictly positive integer, which means n. We look at P sub S of n, so P1 of n would be ordinary partitions. It's the number of partitions. Well, I'll start with P2, as they did too. P2 of n is the number of partitions of n into squares. So for instance, if I do p of 5, then it'll already be 7, because you can write 5 as well. Of course, just 5, 1 plus 4, 2 plus 3, that's into one part, into two parts, into three parts, it could be 1 plus 1 plus 3, or 1 plus 2 plus 2. Into four parts, I guess it could only be 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 2, and finally into 5 parts. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. But if I look at P2 of 5, then since the only squares less than 5 are 4 and 1, either it's uh, 1 plus 4, or it's 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. 
So there are many fewer of them. P2 of 5 is only 2. And the question is, of course, how does P2 of n behave when n is large? And of course, the generating function P2 of q, which I define as the sum uh, P2 of n, q to the n, for exactly the same reason as before. So we define P2 of 0 as 1. There's no other reasonable way. And then it's the same form as before, but with q to the n squared. And similarly, of course, I can say P s of n is the number of partitions of n into, for instance, cubes. If s is 3, so into s powers. And then, of course, exactly the same uh, thing. I'll just write it. So you have the product 1 over 1 minus q to the m to the s. But as I said, only P1 has any kind of modularity properties. So specifically, and I'll come back to this, of course, later, 8 of tau is defined as eq to the 1 24th. You can say that the 24th root of a complex number is not well defined. But remember that q is defined as e to the 2 pi times tau. And then you, can, you simply divide the exponent by 24. That is defined and exponentiate. And then it's times p2 of q inverse. So here it's the product 1 minus q to the m from 1 to infinity, which, uh, and this thing is, of course, p2 of q inverse. So I can, putting p on the other side, p2 of q is the quotient of q to the 1 24th and eta. q to the 1 24th is an elementary function, purely exponential in tau. And eta of tau is a modular form, so we can read off the behavior at all roots of unity. But there's nothing like that for the other tau. So the problem is to do that. And already in this paper, uh, Hardy and Ramanujan, as I said, they discussed this other problem. Actually, they, did, they, they discussed it for a third of a page in the introduction and gave a very weak formula. And I only realized, in fact, when my paper, when my whole investigation was finished, that they actually came back to it uh, 60 pages later at the very end of the paper with no displayed form, it's just in the text. And they gave us a more precise some more precise statements. So one of the things I'd found, they had already found, but I refound it 100 years later, but luckily not everything I found. So it was, there was still some interest. So they asked this, and in particular, they gave the problem, uh, well, they defined, they, they gave the problem uh, with general S. So the S is their let letter, because there'll be a Riemann zeta function soon, and one's used to S, for S equals well, of course, squares are the most interesting case, but it's the first case. And they gave a, in the introduction, they gave a very weak formula. So let me remind again the hardy Ramanujan formula. P of n is, a, the log of P of n, that's quite easy to prove, is asymptotically equal to pi times the square root of 2n over 3. But there's a full formula, which I'll talk about later, but the leading term I didn't write it down, so I don't quite remember. I think it's 4n squared of 3, but it's the exponential of this term here, but then it's corrected. I think it's 4n squared of 3, but anyway, constant times n. And then there's a form, uh, yet much more precise form, which I talked about in my talk on for the Ramanujan day, which was about Ramanujan and partitions. But I'll give it again next time, the time after, when I come to the circle method. So that much they gave here, and the form that they gave was the weaker one, that the log of this grows like a multiple of a power of s. And the, maybe I don't need the name of their paper anymore. Here's the form. This, the constant's a little long. So the constant is s plus 1 times the expression 1 over s, gamma of 1 plus 1 over s. I hope I wrote this correctly, but I think I did. Zeta of 1 plus 1 over s. The whole thing to the power 1 over s plus 1 times n to the 1 over s plus 1. So it's a little bit complicated. But you see that if s is 1, this would be 2. If s is 1, this would be 2. This is 1, gamma of 2 is 1. Zeta of 2 is pi squared over 6 to the 1 half, and then the square root of n. And that's exactly pi times the square root of 2n over 3, which is what I said here. OK, so this formula they already gave. And as I said, I only discovered 
uh, many months later, when I, I'd read the beginning of the paper and some of the calculations, I'd, I'd never got to the discussion at the end where they talk about whether the method could be used in other situations. They actually do give an asymptotic formula corresponding to this one for P S of N for any S. But that's much, much weaker than what we're going to do. Is this just the leading term? And this comes only from the contribution near Q equals one, but it's in fact only a tiny part of that. This is still off by an error of the order of one over n, or one over squared of n. So it's quite poor if n is 200. This is only correct at five digits. Then if you give the full contribution from Q equals one, you have to add three, three correct terms to this. You get an elementary thing like this, but with other terms. And now it's suddenly very accurate, and it gives you, uh, now the error is exponentially small in the square root of n. And then if you can look at the other roots of unity, you can get them all. But they say fairly clearly in their text that it's, you can't really say anything at other roots of unity, so you could at most improve this by looking at q equals one because you don't have multidarity. And that's what, as I say, it turns out, uh, in fact, to work uh, surprisingly well. So again, just to emphasize the multidarity, I said that this function eight of tau, which I defined here, is modular. And so this is very well known. I'll just write down the corresponding things, but they're not going to be true. So here, if I, the modular group is generated by tau goes to tau plus one, which corresponds to this matrix. And then this is trivial. If you change tau to tau plus one, then from this definition, Q doesn't change because Q is e to the two pi i tau. But Q to the 124 changes by the 24th root of unit, the standard one. I'll always use the notation if n is a positive integer, this means the standard root of unity e to the two pi i times one over n. So the one at angle two pi over n. So this is trivial. But what's less trivial, and there are many, many proofs, is that if you take minus one over tau, which corresponds to this matrix, zero minus one, one, zero, or it's negative, then you get the square root of tau over i times eight of tau. And of course, you have to say which square root, but since tau's in the upper half plane, tau over i is in the right half plane, and then there's a canonical square root, the one that is a deformation of the square roots of uh, positive numbers. So if you're in the right half plane, then the square root is in, in this corner, you don't take the one on the left. So these are the two famous forms. And more generally, if you have any element, uh, a, b, c, d of s, l, two, z, then it follows from this that up to some 24th root of unity, so something divided by 24, uh, there's a, you'll always have a factor squared of c tau plus d. It's a multiple form of weight a half. And here you do have to specify which square root you take, but if you take the other one, you're changing by minus one, which is also 24th root of unity. So this will always be true for whichever square root you take, but you have to be careful. And there's a famous formula for this due to, so this is essentially Riemann and Dedekind. So it's called the Dedekind zeta function. This formula was published by Dedekind, but in a paper on a fragment of Riemann, he was asked, he and Weber, I think, to go through the papers of Riemann after his death, and he had left many unfinished things behind, and he had analyzed this function to some extent, and uh, Dedekind you know, finished it and worked out the details and published it, but, but Riemann had actually started studying this function. So it's, let's say, the Riemann-Dedekind function. So this is exactly what we don't have for the higher P2, and that we'll have to somehow get around. But it turns out that, in fact, you do have something. And so, so I'll say the first problem is no modularity, no modular transformation equation. For s bigger than 1, but before I say for s bigger than one, I should perhaps say transformation behavior of what? Because already for p of q, remember p of q is just the product, well, it's the sum p of n q to the n, it's the product one over one minus q to the m. But that doesn't transform, you can't see anything here because when you send tau to tau plus one, you just aren't changing q at all. So p of q is just equal to p of q. And here you get p of q, is you know, some crazy thing involved in the square root of the log of q times p of a q star. You can't read q star off from q because you have to take the log inverted. So you must introduce the function uh, eta of tau even to make sense. And so we'll do that also for higher tau. And we'll do it the same way. Uh, but now I, I want to get the, if 
function right. So remember, e underlined is e to the 2 pi i times the argument. It will always be a multiple in the argument, and actually a rational multiple. So remember, s so far has been a natural integer, although that will change soon, a natural, positive, a natural number, so a positive integer. So zeta minus s is a rational number. So this is a rational power of q, which if s is 2, the next interesting case, the squares is actually 0. So there isn't a correction factor. But if s was 1, you get minus 1 half of minus 12, which is plus 24, which is what just what we saw, and then, of course, multiplied by ps of q inverse, just as it was when s was 1. So the ps of q inverse, it looks artificial, because in the definition of eta, there is no, it, where's the definition? There is no inverse. But in p2, I put in the inverse because it's the generating function of p2. So the natural multiple form is eta, and p2 is actually the reciprocal. So it turns out uh, that this is always a, a good correction factor. So here, the notation will be the same as before. Tau is in the upper half plane, which means complex numbers with positive imaginary parts. And q, I won't repeat it again. q is always e, e to the 2 pi i tau. But what's strange, in a sense, is why should you introduce tau at all? The point of introducing it here was that the multiple group acts by tau plus 1 minus 1 over tau, a tau plus b over c tau plus d. Here, it's not going to act. So you might think, what's the point? But as you'll see, there's very much a point in having the tau variable. So OK, so there's no modularity. But uh, the generalized. Euler-Maclaurin formula, uh, formula, so generalized means with the shift and so on, as discussed earlier in this course. So when I meet it soon, I'll, I'll write it out again. Uh, so that gives the asymptotics of uh, Ps, or A to S, or actually, it's log. At the, but it gives the asymptotics also of these functions to all orders in epsilon when q is equal to e to the to some root of unity. So zeta, I'll just say, it's a generic root of unity. So mu without a letter or mu infinity means all roots of unity. And then we put, let's say, e to the minus epsilon. Or equivalently, well, here I'll actually take 2 pi epsilon. No, I'll put, I'll put uh, call it epsilon for the moment. I don't like either one. Equivalently, tau goes to a, a, a rational number in Q. OK, so as tau descends in the upper half plane towards a rational value here, that means, remember, that Q goes radially, let's say, if this is vertical, to some root of unity. And then we can do that for anything. And the Euler-McLaurin formula gives that entire expansion, not just the leading term, but the entire asymptotic series. But now, you can say, well, but this was way, way better. Because here, as tau goes to uh, infinity, that means that this argument is very small. This thing is equal to q to the 1 24th times 1 plus O of q. But q is exponentially small. And therefore, this, this q to the 1 24th is a terminating series. It's true to all orders. Here, the series we write down will be a bit different, but it turns out that you can improve that. And that's the first big surprise, which I'll talk about, uh, well, I'll prove next time or even next Monday. So in fact, it is, uh, in fact, even though it's not modular, this Euler-McLaurin formula can be lifted to an exact formula. So the exact formula will describe uh, the behavior of this function with any s as tau goes vertically to a rational point or as q goes radially to root of unity. That's, that to me was a surprise, but this is the thing that I discovered actually hard in Ramanuj and gave in one line with no details, but they said you can get that. So eg, if I take the easiest case, this is when kappa is zero. So remember, we're interested in tau tending to a number kappa in the upper half plane, but if tau is zero, then q is tending to one. That's the easiest case to study. And then the formula for eta is the one that I wrote here. It's simply eta of minus 1 over tau is a power of tau, tau to the 1 half up to a constant, and then times eta of tau. So now, here's the exact formula for eta 2. 
And it's really kind of surprising that there is an exact formula. So the asymptotic formula for all orders, I say, is quite easy. Uh, but here's the exact formula. A to 2 of minus 1 over tau is this time it's still got a square root of tau times a constant. It's a different constant from before. Before it was just tau over i. Now it's the square root of 2 pi tau over i. And then it's the product of two functions. See, before it was a multiple form. So we just had a tau. So if here I had the same function, a to 2 of tau, that would be multiplier. But instead, it's a to a half. And if you look at this definition, well, here there's no problem having s to be half. It won't be a rational number anymore. This will be some transcendental number times tau. You can still exponentiate. But PS, this definition, at no place did I use uh, that s was an integer. And this part is, sorry, I didn't even, I didn't even write the definition. The sum PS of n, or q to the n, is, of course, this. That was the generating function. If s is not an integer, let's say s is 1.3, you cannot write as an integer as a sum of 1.3 powers. So there is no p of s n of n q of n. But of course, this function makes perfectly good sense for any real number uh, bigger than 1, actually bigger than 0, I guess. Right? I mean, it's a perfectly convergent series. So we have an excellent function of tau. It's just that it no longer has a power series. So there's no p 1 half of n, but there is a capital p 1 half of Q, and therefore, with this definition, uh, so, but this is now for any S in C, actually, but I'll only use real values, actually, only uh, reciprocals of integers and integers. So for any point in the upper half, in the right half plane, this is a perfectly good function. And so now, the surprise is that A to 2 of minus 1 over tau, it's not, not there, it doesn't map to itself. It goes to a to half. Well, that would already be very nice. That'd be kind of reflection. S goes to 1 over S tau. But it's not true. First of all, two reasons. First of all, this is the square root of tau. So it's not symmetric at all, because from tau, you can go to the square root of tau. But there are two square roots of tau. But you have to take the one in the upper half plane. So remember, tau is in the upper half plane. So square root of tau is, I guess, in the right half plane, or in the right quadrant. But then there's a second term, which is not minus the square root of tau, which is the other square root. That would have to be in the lower half plane. But i times the square root of tau, which is in the left quadrant. So it's a very, and this is an exact formula. So I can even call it theorem. We'll prove it quite a bit later, probably only next Monday. So a to 2 of minus 1 over tau is exactly, and this is not approximate. This is an exact equality that I found first purely numerically with a lot of work, and that I'll talk about today. That's actually the most fun part of the whole thing. And uh, more generally, I can put it in the same theorem. A to s of minus 1 over tau for any integer. But s is still an integer here. Uh, A to s of minus 1 over tau is, again, always the square root of tau over i. But there's a power. Well, you can guess. Here, for s equals 1, it was just the square root of tau over i. Here it's 2 pi to the 1 half, so in general it's 2 pi to the power s minus 1 over 2 times the square root of tau over i. And then it's the product for all z in the upper half plane such that z to the s is plus or minus tau. So if you take all complex numbers whose s power is tau, they're exactly s of them. If you take all complex numbers whose s power is either tau or minus tau, there are two s of them. But they come in pairs z and minus z. So exactly half are in the upper half plane. And none are on the real line, because then their power would be real. And so there are exactly s factors here. And now you can guess the last term. It's actually shorter, because I used this notation, than it was for s equals 2. You have a to sub 1 over s of those z's. So that's the uh, kind of one of the main theorems. But actually, the main theorem on a to will be more complicated. It will be if you put in arbitrary a tau plus b over c tau plus d, or more relevant, we will probably write it usually as, uh, I'll just put for the moment, i epsilon, but usually later I'll have another normalization. So we look at the formulas. You come very close to a rational number from above, first asymptotically, but then on the nose. So OK, so now the next stage is, and now I can erase almost everything. The next stage is to do the, to describe the asymptotics, to discover the asymptotics. So that's been kind of a theme of this course, that even if you're doing quite theoretical mathematics, 
You need computations very often to simply know what the truth is. You have a sequence of numbers, like we had recently with Manuel, or with Pavel, who's not here today, or with many other people, even here in ICTP. You find some problem. You get a bunch of numbers. You want to recognize them. You want to understand them. You have to, A, know how to calculate reasonably, and B, you have to know how to recognize asymptotics or do asymptotics. And that turned out actually here to be the most fun part of the whole project, was figuring out what is the correct exact asymptotics. So let me take, I'll concentrate most on S equals 2, because the ideas are the same, and it's easier. Occasionally, I'll give the forms for general S. So let me assume. So the whole problem is, so we want numeric, numerical, numerical results. And the problem is find the asymptotics of, once again, A to S of cap. So S is always going to be an integer greater than or equal to 1, well, greater than or equal to 2, because we know it for 1. Uh, and then plus I epsilon, cap is always going to be a rational number. And epsilon, let's say, goes down to 0. It could come also in a cone, in a cone but let's say vertically for the moment. And uh, so, sorry, here, as epsilon goes to 0. But first, to all orders, that'll be more Euler McLaurin. And then exactly. And it turns out that it's uh, that, it, that the answer is quite fun and, and, as I say, fits in well with methods of this course because there's a lot of, uh, first there's some Euler McLaurin, then there's some guesswork. So let me do the step one. So I'll concentrate first on the case when S is 2, the very easiest case after the, and cap is 0. So now we're talking about, you know, P2 as Q goes to 1. So then Q goes to 1, I can call it E to the minus X, where X goes to 0. OK, so we look at P2 of e to the minus x. And for this, you just use Euler Maclaurin. And I'm going to actually do that quickly, because we did that at the beginning of the course. You may have forgotten. And if you haven't forgotten, it's nice and relaxing. It takes only a couple of minutes. So what will happen when you do it is just as for the eta function, uh, you will have a constant over the square root of x. Well. There it was 1 over x, but here it'll be 1 over the square root of x. For higher s, it would be 1 over the s root of x. Here there's a power which is always the square root of x. But in principle, there would be a whole infinite power series, c0 plus c1 epsilon rho x plus c2 x squared. But in fact, the error term is O of x to the n for all n as x goes to infinity. So in other words, the first, but that will find from straight or the McLaurin. And it's a bit of a surprise, because in the one that I gave in my course as an exercise at the very beginning, I also, I think, called it P2, for which I apologize, but here I really don't want to change it. That was a different, instead of putting Q to the n squared, which is n times n, you take it to the nth power here. And then this one, you could take the log, but it had an asymptotic expansion that did not terminate, even for the log, because it had products of the Bernoulli number times the Bernoulli number 2 later, bn times bn plus 2. If n is even, n plus 2 is also even, and both Bernoulli numbers are non-zero. Whereas for p1 or p3 or p5, you'd have bn times bn plus 1 or bn plus 3. They have opposite parities, and remember, the odd Bernoulli numbers are zero. So this has a non-terminating uh, asymptotics. Asymptotic expansion, means to say, has non-terminate asymptotics. But this one turns out, as I've just written, for s, but it's the same for every s. There's a slightly different formula. This is the same I wrote before, gamma of 1 plus 1 over s, eta of 1 plus 1 over s, x to the 1 over minus 1 over s. But it's always, there's just a finite expression, and then it's to all orders. So because that's just, as I say, it's relaxing, because we already know how Euler McLaurin works, let me remind you briefly how that goes. That's the thing I did much earlier in the course, which was the asymptotics of functions of the form f of nt. So I'll do it quite quickly. So of course, since we want the sum, and this was a product, I first take the sum. So this is minus the sum m from 1 to infinity log of 1 minus q to the n, which is now e to the m squared, or m to the 
Actually, now I'm doing S. Why don't I do it for general S? Now, even though I wrote it for S equals 2, it makes no difference in the calculation. And it's fun to see that the fact that it terminates will always happen, whether S is even or odd. So this would be the function. And so if I replace x by t to the s, then this thing is equal to the sum, m from 1 to infinity, f sub s of mt, where f s of t is equal to minus log of 1 minus e to minus uh, t to the s. So you see, and we, we've had that before in the other function, we have to make the small change of variables to get it in the form of what I discussed towards the beginning of the course, infinite sums of the form sum f of mt, where m is a nice function. Nice meant small at infinity. This is certainly small at infinity. If t is large, this is exponentially close to, uh, to 1, and so it's log exponentially close to 0, so it's rapidly convergent. It isn't quite analytic at 0, so remember, well, you can expand this. This function is, of course, just whatever it was. So that expansion I gave when we were talking then, because we had an example, the function log of 1 minus e to the minus x is equal now, I have to get it right that I don't make any mistakes. It's log 1 over x plus x over 2 minus x squared over 24 plus x to the fourth over 2880, and so on. It's an alternating sum, and the general term is br over r factorial, x to the r over r, except for the log 1 over x term. Okay? So here you do the same x as t to the s as it in fact already was. So here uh, we'll have, well, the same thing, but it'll therefore be uh, s times the log 1 over t, t to the s, plus the sum r from 1 to infinity, br over r factorial times t to the r over r, but it's now t to the s r. Now, that means for this, we gave a general form that this will always be uh, some integral, which is the integral of fs divided by t plus, and if it were just a power series, then remember that was Riemann and Euler. You just multiplied t to the n by zeta of minus n. But when we did that there, when you have f, the sum f of mt, you, you start with the integral of f divided by t, but then any term t to the lambda goes to zeta minus lambda t to the lambda. That was kind of the Euler point of view. But log of 1 over t goes to log 1 over t, uh, I think, times minus a half, because it's zeta of a half, so 1 half, plus roughly Euler's constant. I'll write it in a second. But there is a formula uh, for what you have to do if there's a log term. So, But the first thing is we need to know the integral. So this is standard, but I might as well quickly do it. So we first need the integral. So i of fs is the integral from 0 to infinity fs of t dt. So I think the quickest way to do it, that there are several ways you can do it by parts. But if we just take this thing, then of course, using the power series of log, uh, it's this log minus log 1 minus x is the sum 1 over k x to the k. So it's minus k t to the s. So this would be the sum k from 1 to infinity. 1 over k times the integral from 0 to infinity. And then it's uh, e, uh, what did I just write? It's uh, e to the minus k. Yes. And here you just make a change of variables. You replace t again by uh, x is 1 over s. So this will become 1 over s times the integral 1 over s minus 1 dx, that's the dt, and this will become e to the minus kx. And this, of course, is exactly the integral. So this integral is 1 over s times that, but that is 1 over s times the gamma function of 1 over s times k to the minus 1 over s. And therefore, this whole thing, 1 over s gamma of 1 over s is gamma of 1 plus 1 over s, and the sum over k of 1 over k, k to the minus s is zeta, of 1 plus 1 over s. So that's the value of this integral. It is easy and fun. So therefore, if I use this formula now, and I use this one, let me leave that there because I need it. 
So this one will be equal to what I just wrote, gamma of 1 plus 1 over s. Zeta of 1 plus 1 over s divided by t, which is, remember, x to the 1 over s. And now the log term, well, it's s log 1 over t, and that's the one that I wrote before here. I'll just write the answer. Oh, it doesn't involve gamma. I was stupid. When you do log, it involves square root of t, square root of 2 pi over t. So here you get the same. So what you get is the log of t over 2 pi times s, but if I want it in terms of x, it becomes this. Uh, and then the next term, this is plus. And then there's one more term, but then that's the whole joke. There's only one more term. Because if I look at this when r is 1, then for r is 1, I'll have minus a half, because that's b1. One factor all is 1, and I have t to the s. But remember, t to the s always goes to zeta of minus s. So what I get, for some reason, my notes say plus a half, so one of them is wrong. I should probably call I checked it on the computer this morning, so it should be correct. So t to the s is x. But now comes the fun part. For all other terms, if r is bigger than 1, so bigger than or equal to 2, then we'll have uh, br over r times r factorial. t to the rs will become x to the r, so it's a power series in x. But the coefficient here is zeta of minus rs. But if r is odd and bigger than 1, br is always 0, so r is even. But if r is even, then whether s is even or odd, rs is even, and zeta negative even integers is 0. And so it just stops to all orders. So that's the little calculation I want to show you. And uh, either I got some sign right or I didn't. So now if you exponentiate that, of course, you immediately get ps of e to the minus x is the exponential. It's the same except this is gamma of 1 plus 1 over s, zeta of 1 plus 1 over s, x to the minus 1 over s. Here, s was 2. Then there's always a term square root of x over 2 pi. So actually, I might as well just do it. This will become 2 pi. Well, I can even put it inside x over 2 pi to the s. This will become what I just said, gamma of 1 over 1 plus s, zeta of 1 plus 1 over s, x to the minus 1 over s. And, uh, and then finally, there's one more exponential term, which is plus a half if I got the sign right. For s equals 2, you don't see it, so I can't check against what I just wrote. But it's that in the exponent. So this is just Euler-Maclaurin. And you can do the same at roots of unity. I'll probably do that, and I'll just give the answer later uh, with the shifted oil in the chlorine. And the same thing happens. It terminates if you do it right. So that's very, very nice. OK. But now, of course, we want to know, can we find out anything about this epsilon of x? So let me write it, not as approximately that, but as I did before. It's that times 1 plus epsilon out epsilon s of x. And this is very small. So very small means actually it'll be exponentially small, as we'll see in either x or t. So it's, it's, but it's faster. It's going to 0 faster than any power uh, of x as x goes to 0. So now the question is, since we're hoping to find an exact formula, though at the beginning I didn't know there would be one, but I certainly want to know the asymptotics to high order. Can you actually find this? So again, now I'll go back to the simplest case, which is uh, s equals 2, and I'm already just taking x going to 0, so cap is 0, I'm just, so q goes to 1. I'm not looking at other points. So what is epsilon 2 of x? So of course, you can graph it. So here is x. It starts at, let's say, 1. It's good. And when you graph this, I won't even try, what you get is, first of all, it's extremely small. When you make a graph, it's exponentially small. And secondly, it oscillates. So it's very hard to see what's happening. So what, what do you do numerically? So let's say the, the thing I want to emphasize now is that it oscillates, and therefore it's not easy to recognize. So I'll tell you the zeroth step, which is how to recognize it a little bit. But then there are three simplifications. And without all three, you couldn't do the higher, higher case at all. Even this one would be extremely difficult. But with that, it becomes quite star. So this epsilon of x, epsilon 2 of x, is both exponentially small which makes it hard to recognize. But of course, you can increase the size of your axis. You don't care that it's a small number. I mean, you're adding up lots of contributions. In Paris, you can easily work to 1,000 or 2,000 digits. 
And this power series for PS, remember that this was the product, 1 minus e to the minus m squared x. So it's convergent. The mth term is not just exponentially small. It's exponentially small m squared. So if you take, you know, if you go to 1,000, you're talking about e to the million x, even if x is very small. So there's no problem calculating this to very high precision. These numbers are exact. You divide, you subtract 1, you get epsilon of x to all the precision you need. The problem is not to compute it. It's to recognize it. So it's exponentially small and highly oscillatory. as x goes to 0. So that makes it a priori not easy to recognize. However, even a quick look shows that the amplitude, so the size, is roughly, I mean, of the order of e to some constant, in this case, over the square root of x, well, minus the square root of x. So it's blowing up. P2 is getting very big. Uh, sorry, no, P2 is getting very big. A is getting very small. So it's a constant over the square root of x, OK, as you tend to infinity. So that already tells you we should make a change of variables as we already did before. Remember, x was t to the s, and so t was the s root of x. And also the oscillations, the period of the oscillations, so how far you have to go. As you go in, it oscillates more and more. But if you look at the difference roughly between the troughs, you see from the difference that the period is growing roughly like x to the 3 halves. So you know, if, if x is a thousandth, then a thousandth to the 3, well, let's say 10,000, it's easier, then it would be a million. Then if you take t a 10,000th minus a millionth, it'll be the next trough. So that suggests the first simplification. So we're going to do this in three steps. I have to follow my notes because it's a complicated thing. So this implies the first simplification. I change variables. from x to a new t, so x is going to 0, t will be going to infinity, and they're related that x is a constant over t squared, or in general, it'll be 2 to the s. But it turns out that it's, if I could put 1, but it would rescale, and the, the forms will come out nicer if I take all this 2 pi over t to the s. And that's logical if you remember the q, because now I'm writing the thing as e to the minus x. But then q would be e to the 2 pi times something. Remember, q deep down is e to the 2 pi i tau. So the 2 pi is reasonable. But anyway, that's just normalization. And then it's not so hard to recognize for epsilon 2 that if I take x, which is now 2 pi over t squared. So now, as I said, it's exponentially small in t, purely exponentially in t, as t goes to infinity, times an oscillatory function. But now the oscillatory function has a constant period because I've made this change of variables. Right, it's, it's uh, t is 1 over the square root of x. But if I take the nth position, the nth trough, it'll be the difference one to con up to constants, 1 over square root of n minus 1 over square root of n plus 1. That's like n to the minus 3 halves. So the period between two uh, maximum and minimum, that was like x to the 3 halves. But the, it means that the period itself, I mean, the, the variable has to be something like sine or cosine of the square root of x. So therefore, you get that. And now, how do you do that in practice? So you have a function now, t is going to infinity. And you have something whose graph looks like this. It's exponentially small, but it is roughly constant period. So how do you find, so it looks roughly like e to the minus lambda t times cosine of, you know, let's say, beta t plus a phase, something like that. So how do you recognize it? How do you find the, those three numbers? Well, first, you make a guess. And then you look if you can recognize the numbers. So for the maxima, what you do is you take the maxima of the absolute value. So you graph it first. And then you can zero in on the computer very quickly in Paris. It takes a split second to compute individual values. And you find that if you take the maxima and you take their ratio, then that tells you exactly what lambda is. And so you quickly find lambda just from the graph to, let's say, three decimals. And then you recognize it. I'll write it down in a second. And now, once you've recognized, you divide your function by e to the minus lambda t. Now, it has the order of 1. It's a pure sinus, sine function. And then what you do is you look at the successive crossings to a high thing. And they're extremely regular. So you take that distance, and you recognize that. And it's very easy. In fact, it's the same. Lambda and beta turn out to be the same. It makes it even easier. And then once you have that, you have to work out the phase. And here, that's 
even easier. So that turns out not at all difficult. So after this change of variables, you easily recognize the, the leading. Uh, this should have been in a box because I'm giving the formula. This thing is roughly 2. So there's a constant, but it's 2. Well, 2 to lots of digits. And once you've guessed it, then you just divide by this, or you subtract this, and you see that it's equal to exponentially high order. So the exponential turns out to be e to the minus square root of 2 times pi times t. That's not a hard number. If you have an exponential or cosine, you want to write it as something times 2 pi anyway. And then recognizing square root of 2 is not very hard. So this is the exact formula. Let me call this function, and you'll see why in a second, a1 of t. So here we have a1 of t, which is a pure exponential multiplied by cosine function, or if you like complex numbers, it's a sum of two pure exponentials, e to the minus lambda 1t and lambda 2t, where lambda 1 and lambda 2 have real parts square root of 2 pi, but they have imaginary part also uh, square root of 2 pi, given the cosines. So that's the first, uh, the, the beginning. And now you continue, and you say, OK. I won't write that formula again because I haven't erased it. It's right there. So epsilon 2 of, of x, which is 2 pi over t squared, is very nearly uh, epsilon 1. So now that we know that, I mean, this is experimental. Everything's experimental. You subtract that, and you make a graph of this next function. And the next function, again, is exponentially small, but it's exactly the same thing. You look at the highest points. You take the ratio. You find the new lambda. And then you take the other part, the cosine, and it turns out it's really easy. easy. So this thing is uh, just as easy as, as what we just did. It turns out that it's a new function, and it's particularly easy to recognize because it's just the original function stretched by a factor of square root of 2. So let's call this one a2 of tau. And now if I take epsilon, I won't keep writing this, minus a1 of t minus a2, then still just as easy. You just do the same thing. And what you find, well, you could almost guess, it's t times the square root of 3, which I'll now call a3 of tau, a3 of t. So this would be something with e to the uh, minus pi times, I guess, the square root of 6, e to the minus square root of 6 times pi t. But now, so now, of course, everybody can see uh, you know, that's how it goes on. Uh, I'll put some L from 1 to 3, A L of tau. But it's not uh, a, a 4. What you would now guess is, of course, 2t, which is the, t times the square root of 4. So that would be, if it were that, in fact, sorry, A1 of 2t. So it's not A1 of 2t. It's something which you can recognize, and I'll say it. So let's call this A4 of t. But it's no longer given by quite the same formula. Let me get it right. A4 of t, it has exactly the exponential you would have expected. Namely, the previous exponential, e to the square root of 2 pi t, times 2, which is the square root of 4. But the prefactor is no longer 2 cosine. It's 1 plus 4 times the same cosine. So it's not you know, wildly difficult to recognize. In fact, it's quite easy to recognize. But it's not easy to predict. And above all, now what's the next one going to be? OK? So already there's a bit of a surprise that the, you know, there's a slight irregularity. So now we continue. I'll go, I'm going to the left because I, I didn't plan the use of the board correctly. So now when you do the next one, now uh, epsilon minus the sum 1 to the 4 of uh, a i of tau, I, now I'm using i, I think I used i, uh, is indeed uh, a5 of tau, which is just what you would expect. So this is defined as a1 of square root of 5t. So here there's no anomaly. But now the next one is, is not just not right. When you subtract that, epsilon of this minus the sum 1 to 5, a5. So at least when we subtracted 1 to 3, it wasn't quite what we expected, but it was the right order of magnitude. It was the same exponential. It was just a different cosine. But this thing is much bigger than what you would have expected, which is e to the minus square root of 6 times 2, so 12 times pi times t. I mean, it's exponentially much bigger. It's the wrong answer. So we have a new term, which we didn't expect at all. 
And so you do the same again. You stare at it for a while. And it's harder to recognize because when you, you can guess the exponential after a while, you divide by the exponential, but now you see a function that's not a pure cosine curve. It's periodic, it does, I, I can't draw it, but it's, you know, it's, it's got two uh, cosine terms. So it's the sum of four pure exponentials. So it's already considerably harder to recognize. So in fact, this sum, when I subtract from one to five, the next term is something completely different. It's again, two cosine, but this time it's two plus the square root of two times pi t plus two times the cosine of the complex, uh, algebraic conjugate, two minus the square root of two pi t times e to the minus two plus square root of two pi t, which is not at all the square root of 12 pi t. It's, it's a, it's, it's bigger. Well, I mean, it's a smaller number, but negative. So this is a bigger. Sorry, this is all. Yeah, everything is small. I mean, it's extremely small. But this is not as small as, as square root of 12. So let's call this one b1 of t. So now we have a1 up to a5, where a1 is this rather simple function, a pure cosine function. Uh, where's a1 even gone? I hope it's still. Did I erase it? If I erase, I should put it back. So, oh, no. Uh, yeah, a1 of t, maybe I should put back, was, is it still here somewhere? Where? Ah, it just didn't say, oh, yeah, here, a1 of t, thank you. So a1 is this uh, pure exponential. A2, A3, and A5 were just this, where you replace t by t times the square root of m. A4 had little anomaly, but now we've got this B1, which looks completely different. So now we continue. And then after a while, you see if we keep continuing that way, we have more and more guesswork. And at some point, you, you just, uh, it, it wouldn't work that way. So, but let me give you the next little bit. Of the, these are, I'm telling you the actual truth. These are the experiments in the same order that I did it, basically, it's once you have to do it, you study it, but it, it takes several days. Then you, at each stage, you find the next bit. It keeps coming out a little at a time. So when you continue, uh, then, well, I'm going to stop for that bit for the moment, because that is where I stopped. And so at this point, we have to think a little. This was already quite a nasty thing to recognize. It turns out when you subtract this, the next term is fairly easy. It's exactly the a6 of t you would have expected. And so is a7. But then again, you have a funny one coming in. And it's, again, a sum of several terms like this, a kind of a b2. And it will be called b2. They get very hard to recognize. But now is the second simplification. Well, I'll write it in a second. But first, I'll explain the reason. So what is the problem? All of the terms so far for epsilon, all of these a and b and so on, where uh, epsilon, which here was 2 pi over, well, epsilon 2 of 2 pi over t squared, is a sum of pure exponentials. I mean, a linear combination is some, uh, I guess, to sum with coefficients. So linear combination, so it's got, let's say, c nu e to the lambda nu t minus lambda nu t, where the real part of lambda nu is going to infinity. But the problem is, that, the, that there are several mu's with the same real part. And so there's different exponentials with exactly the same growth, but different oscillatory, different phases. So the solution now, assume that there were one, just one. If I had a function epsilon, which was just c e to the lambda t. So if I have some function of t, let's call it g of t. And if it is this plus exponentially smaller terms, then there's absolutely no problem when it's exponentially good recognizing lambda t. Because you just take the ratio g of t plus 1 over g of t when t is large. t is going to infinity. Then the c will cancel. The lambda t will cancel. You have just lambda plus exponentially small in t. So if t is 20, you know, this will be 10 to the minus 10 or something. So you get e to the lambda to the high precision. Take the log, and you recognize lambda. Once you've got lambda, you divide this function by e to the lambda. It converts exponentially rapidly to c. And so you're done. The whole problem is we have, two, we have now, we have Let's say two terms like that before c1 e to the lambda 1 and c2. But c1 is c2 bar, and lambda 1 is lambda 2 bar. And then they get mixed up. And then in the next case, we had four such terms. So it gets harder and harder. So the trick is really simple. And this is a trick I'd found. I'm sure other people have thought of it in life. 
well, I should write down his name, Stavrosko Felidis, with whom I did the work that was discussed in last year's course. We had similar asymptotic problems for something. We found the trick, and the trick is really, really simple. You let t go to infinity as before, but uh, along a line in C with a positive or negative slope. You just choose the slope. So instead, if you're t, simply you go to infinity, 10, 11, 12 to 15, you go at some angle, let's say you know, 20 degrees. It doesn't really matter. But when you do that, the t is now some absolute value of t times e to the i theta, where theta is maybe relatively small. Now, the different terms, lambda mu of t, will have completely different real parts. And so one will be asymptotically dominant. As long as you have different terms, different real parts, you just do this. You take your function at t plus 1 and t. The ratio tends to e to the lambda. You divide by e to the lambda. You get the c. Subtract it. Yeah? What? Oh, of going in, yeah, but no, but his real trick was taking a big sum of, of n terms, and that surprised me. No, the thing of coming at the angle in D that I've, I've been using now for, for three or four years. Thanks for the comment, yeah. Okay, and here you should be careful. If you take this way high, then much later terms that you don't want to see yet will start to dominate. So you just want to go, ideally you just go, you know, three degrees is just to separate, like you do when you do spectroscopy. There's a line with multiplicity three, and you do something, so it separates. But if you separate it too little, they're hard to recognize. You want to separate it enough that they shouldn't bump into the next eigenvalue. But when you do the experiments, there's no problem. And so when you do this, it immediately works, and then you can get the next couple of terms. And so what you find, so this works. So it works. Here I can be enthusiastic and put it works great. It's not quite English, but it's standard colloquial English. It works great, and up to the order of e to the minus, so remember we always had, if I just had the ams, it was the square root of 2m times t. So if I go, I'm going to include 11 but not 12, so I'm going to go beyond 22, I actually stopped at 22.3, because then the terms were still getting harder and harder, and then comes the third simplification. But so far, if we go up to this, then what you find is that epsilon m in this range, epsilon 2 we're always doing, s is 2, is the sum, well, the 11s, uh, remember, e a m of t was roughly e to the minus square root of 2m times pi times t. So 2m should go up to 22.3, so m goes to 11, not infinity, 11, a m of t. And then we have some uh, 4, b m of t, and that's all you get up to 11. So we already had 1b1 that I wrote here, rather complicated mess. And so the AMs, let me give, I think, how am I doing on time? I'm kind of doing OK. Maybe I'll actually give the formulas for these because they're sort of fun. And I'm given what I've prepared. I think I'm, I'm OK. So what you find, I have to tell you what the AM is. So AM of t, I have to give you 11 values. But it was simply 2 times the cosine Oh, sorry, it's, excuse me. The exponential is always the same. It's the square root of 2m times pi times t times, and then remember the original one was 2 cosine of the same number, square root of 2m pi t, and this was for all m up to 11, because that's as far as we're going. But remember, for m equals 4, there was an anomaly. It wasn't quite like for m equals 1. I think it's still on the board. It was 1 plus 4. But for 1, 2, 3, and 5, it was the same. So it's also for uh, all m up to 11 if m is square free. Well, there are only three square numbers that aren't square free. Two of them are 4 and 8, so powers of 2. And if it's 4 and 8, then in both cases, you get just what we had before, the same cosine, but this time multiplied by 4, plus 1. So we already had that for m equals 4, and it's the same for 8. But it's not quite the same for 9, which is the only other non-square free number in this particular range. That one has a 6 times cosine of the square root of, uh, well, I can just put 2m, but of course 2m will be 18. But I want to write it more or less uniformly.
Well, this is t over 3, and you can see t over 3 is t over d, where d squared divides m. It's not square free. So the second term has a smaller order of magnitude. And here it looks odd, because I didn't divide this by 2. You'll see in a minute why it, why it comes. So actually, this is a sum of two exponentials, e to the i x and e to the minus x. This is a sum of 3, but one of them happens to be e to the 0 x, and this is a sum of 4. So in general, there's a certain number of terms. OK, but, and BM is much more interested. So uh, interest, well, there are only four of them. So I already gave it to you if M was 1, so it's on the board. And I don't want to write all four. Uh, this I didn't put on my paper because the forms are too long. Here, I'll give you either the first one or maybe the most complicated. So each one will be a sum of two terms. I'll do the last one. So if M is 2, 3, if anybody wants to see them, of course, I can write it out. I'll just give the last one. The, the, this m has no meaning. I've just numbered them in order. But the fourth one will be 2 cosine. But now it's not just the square root of an integer times pi t. Or even like it was before, the square root of 2 plus 1. It's the sum of 2 square root, square root of 10 plus the square root of 2. And then there's another term, which is what you now expect, which is exactly the same. So it's two cosines. And then there's a single exponential, which is, again, what you now might expect, square root of 10 plus the square root of 2 times pi times t. So the b terms have a more complicated exponential, which is e to the minus pi times the sum of two square roots of even numbers instead of a single square root. But now if you keep going, you'll eventually come to your first C, which is three things. It gets more and more complicated. You wouldn't want to do this forever. And as far as I know, there is no reasonable closed form like this. But the third simplification is actually obvious once you think of it. But for some reason, I didn't when I was doing this. Because you get hooked in you know, getting one more term at a time. And then you say, oh, I can recognize that. And I got you know, 11, 11 plus 4, that's 15 terms. And of course, it was already right to 400 digits. And so one is very pleased. But the third simplification is since, well, the reason is, remember this 1 plus epsilon is the error term in PS of something, which is some prefactor, which is something exponential, times 1 plus epsilon. But P is defined as an infinite product. So surely you should be looking at the log of it, which is an infinite sum. And therefore, this exponential in front, well, there's a constant power of x and exponential. That'll just be something linear and powers and maybe a log term. But then you won't have epsilon. You'll have epsilon minus epsilon squared over 2 and so. So we should look at the log of 1 plus epsilon s of x instead of epsilon s of x itself. And now when you do that, at least for this case, which remember, we're still doing the simplest case, s is 2. That doesn't make such a big difference. s equals 3 would go the same way. But we're still only letting x, x tend to 0, uh, or tau tend to 0, or, or q tend to 1. We're not yet looking at rational numbers and roots of unity, which I'll do next. But without these three simplifications, you couldn't even find the leading term there. And you'd be uh, uh, totally lost, I assure you. At least I certainly was, and it's really numerically very unconvincing. But if you do this here, it's, uh, it's very easy. And you immediately see what you're getting numerically. So let me find in the notes on what page I put this. So what you find is that you find to all orders so now this was a formula that was not to all orders. This was up to e to the minus square root of 22.3. There were 11 a terms. And even the a terms weren't in closed form. I gave you the generic one for square free, but some exceptions. b, I didn't even give you all four. It's kind of a mess. But then there'll be c terms, d terms, and so on, with more and more complicated exponents. But when you take the log, again, I'm just doing the case of uh, s equals 2, but you could do any s. It comes out much the same way. Then this one is the sum of pure exponentials. And this is now to all orders. But it's not just all orders in 1 over t, which it already was. But now it's e in e to the minus 
Sotnik T. So in other words, the, uh, any error that we still have will be smaller than any exponential. So it's more than exponential decay. Uh, so it's equal, you know, I could put three equal signs very, very nearly. And now it's the sum. And now you have pure terms. It's always, I can call it M again. It's simply e to the, exactly what we had before, squared of even numbers times pi times t times the cosine of 2 pi, uh, oh, sorry, of squared of 2m pi t. So that was exactly our, our a term, except there's a pre factor, but that's all. There are no mixed terms. When you have a sum of terms and you exponentiate, you get one, that was the one of the one plus epsilon. Then we have all the terms, then you have the half of the sum of two at a time, three at a time, but since they're all different exponentials, that's what gave those mixed terms. So this is just a huge simplification. And the only problem is to recognize the coefficient and that turns out also to be rather easy. This is the minus one sum. So remember sigma, we've used this notation before. The minus first sigma, so sigma k in general of n, is the sum of a positive device of n of d to the k. So here it's d inverse. So that means that if it's squared of n, uh, then we have to take one over d summed over all d, which as algebraic numbers divide the square root of n, which means we take all square divisors of m. And so that's why when m was square free, it's just one, and you didn't get anything, you just got a two. But if m isn't square free, you get mixed terms, and then you get the whole formula. So that, you know, once you realize that taking the log, then you immediately just get this up to a coefficient, and the coefficient is one, 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 three halves, one, 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 again, three halves, then four thirds, and after a while you see, I'm just taking the sum one over d over all divisors uh, over d such that d squared divides m. So that was uh, very easy. But let me, uh, first of all, write this now in a nicer form, so I don't want to lose my notes. So if I write this thing, by the way, this should be a reflex if you're used to doing any kind of uh, you know, number theory, you would have this in a very simple analytic number theory, just formal. You, this is a double sum, because I'm summing over m, but here I have a sum d divides. Right? This was for any n, so n here is square root of m. So d squared divides m, but then it becomes a separate sum. I can write m as d squared times k, where d and k now independently range over positive numbers. And then I'll have 1 over d, and the square root of 2m will be nice. The square root of k is a mess, but that's just pure exponential. And so I get a sum, the sum over d is the sum 1 over d times something to the d. But that's again a log. So what you get, therefore, is equal exactly to the sum m from 1 to infinity but then there are going to be two terms because the cosine, remember, is e to the pi i t plus e to the minus pi t. So it's, a, it's an infinite sum, m from 1 to infinity, and then a sum over, I'll just put plus or minus, and then minus log of 1 minus e. Of course, it has to be oscillatory. And it's this. There's no two anymore in the square root. I to the one half, remember, is so the square root of i. Well, square root of i is one plus i over the square root of two. And that's why we had, uh, the square root of two with the two becomes square root of two m. That's why we had that. And the one plus i times a real number lambda is why we always said e to the minus lambda t times cosine lambda t with the same lambda. So this is the formula. But now. This equality is that this infinite sum converts and is equal to that. This was to all orders. But actually, a uh, big surprise for me, except that, as I said, I discovered that Hardy and Ramanujan had found that a century earlier. Big surprise, present discovery. When you now compute this new approximation uh, to, let's say, 1,000 decimals, where t now doesn't have to be very big anymore, you can take t to be 1, then what you find is that this is simply equal. And so it's equal to this. And that is, uh, I haven't proved it, of course, but that is the theorem that I gave at the beginning. Uh, remember, that was that a to 2 of minus 1 over tau was something with a to half of square root of tau and a to half of square root of i tau. You have to figure out tau is i, x, and then there's some extra squares. But this is exactly that statement. But you have to still prove it. But I've shown, I haven't even shown this to every order. I only showed by Euler and McLaurin that the leading term was 1 plus 0. All I knew was that epsilon is very small. But then experimentally, we got these successive terms. But it is, in fact, equal, and I'll be proving that a little bit 
later. So there is a small subtlety, and I want to mention it. If you compare the theorem as we just got it here, so now I've probably erased all the definitions of what P2 originally was. But remember, the original thing was that the P2 function itself, it had a big exponential which contained gamma of 1 plus 1 over s, eta of 1 plus 1 over s. And then there was a factor squared of t over some power of 2 pi. And then there was this 1 plus epsilon. So when you take the log, I've just given you the 1 plus epsilon. That's essentially the eta. But if you remember the definition of eta, which you have no reason to do, so I'll write it out again, eta of tau, I'll just use the Q notation, move the you know, Q to a complex power means e to the 2 pi times that number times tau. This was Q to the minus a half zeta of minus s. So for ordinary partition, zeta of minus 1 is minus a twelfth. That was Q to the 1 24th. And then was the product, m greater than or equal to 1, 1 minus Q to the m to the s. Right? This was our original, sorry, a that would be if s is 1. This is a to s of tau. So there was this factor, 1 half zeta of minus s. But now we have this factor gamma of 1 plus s. So the small point, if you believe this uh, thing, let's call this equation star. So this is the one we found empirically by finding log of 1 plus epsilon to, to all orders. We found the sum with the sigma minus 1 that I raised. We rewrote it as a sum of logs. This is eta. And so that's, and then you find out it's exactly true. And I claim that's the same as the theorem I wrote at the beginning, which, uh, well, I could even rewrite it because I think this was squared of two. I, I've only forgotten the constant, and it's on the first page of my notes. It was the square root of two pi. I might as well write it again. The theorem said that this was exactly true. But when you compare, then a to two contains this uh, minus one half, zeta of minus two, but zeta of minus two is zero anyway, so you don't see it. But a to half on the right-hand side is zeta of minus a half. And here we had zeta of a half times zeta of three halves. So we need, you have to use the, I'll put the Euler, but Riemann proved it, but Euler found it, functional equation of zeta to get that the number that we actually had in some exponent, which is two pi to the minus a half, gamma of three halves, zeta of three halves, is equal to minus pi times the square root of two times zeta of minus a half. I mean, so it's, it's easy if we know the functional equation, but if you want to compare the two formulas, it doesn't come out with the original s, it comes out with the s on the wrong side. So you, you need to use that. Okay, so that finishes my discussion of the numerical fun, how you find this expansion numerically, and then the final surprise is when you, so you first can't find it all because it's oscillatory. You have to do a little guesswork to even get going. Then you realize the oscillation of the square root, you should change variables from x to the square root of x, which you call 1 over t. Then the next step is you let t go at an angle. Then you can separate the different exponents. Then you could write down the first 20 terms, but after a while you have to give up. And then you say, how about if I take the log? And then it's easy to recognize. So we're going to do all of that at roots of unity, and then we'll absolutely need it because it's still much harder to recognize. Even when you have that, it's only barely doable. I'll do that. Uh, I th I think that's the last thing I want to do today, so I can do that right now, and then I'll stop for today. So when you do PS, I think I won't, no, I did already write that thing for PS uh, back, uh, you know, PS. Did I write or did, didn't I? E to the minus X. I think I actually wrote it, but if I didn't, just to feel virtuous, I'll put it. So the full expression for ps of x is x goes to 0, s is a fixed integer, is square root of x over 2 pi to the s over 2. Uh, no, I, I know I did write it. I remember now. It was the gamma of 1 plus 1 over s, zeta of 1 plus 1 over s, x to the minus 1 over s, plus 1 half zeta of minus s x, and then times 1 plus epsilon. Of course, I wrote that, yeah. OK, so that's what happens as x goes to 0. But now we want to know about rational points. And now we're going to need all of our skill. I mean, it would be completely hopeless without the three tricks. And it's actually, it took, you know, it certainly took me more than a week with the tricks before I recognized all the terms. And I kept making every mistake in the book. So I presented it as if it's really easy to do. But frankly, it's, it's kind of a mess. So I'm going to take, so the final question for today is what about rational points? So either 
we're going to look at A to S. I'll usually take S equals 2 because that, that's not the important thing. They all behave the same. Either A to the S as tau tends to a kappa, which is a rational number. I can't quite put Q over Z because A to S of tau has this exponential factor that maybe I wrote and maybe I didn't here. And this is a rational number. So if you change tau by 1, you don't change Q, but you do change Q to the 1 24th. You have to change tau by 24. So in general, it would be periodic. But that's not the problem. So tau is really in Q, not Q mod Z. So it's some rational number. Uh, that's the easy part. But uh, so an equivalent in Q, which is e to the 2 pi tau, tends to some zeta, which is a root of unity. OK, so I'm going to choose, as my example, s equals 2. And denominator of cap is 5. So I'll call it a over 5, where a is prime to 5. And I mean, actually, if I don't do it for eta, but if I do it for a q, then uh, it is now periodic. Because after, now a of p, p2, remember, is the same thing as eta without the prefactor with an inverse. So now it's truly periodic in period 1. It's a, it's a, a power series in q. And so now calculus of reading Q mod C. So here I wrote A is 5. So you could take A is 1, 2, 3, or 4. But it's periodic. And so A is really an element of Z modulo 5Z star multiplicative. So I'm going to do this. That's the one that I, I chose. If I'd started with the half, maybe it would have been easier. But maybe it wouldn't, because then it's much simpler. And then you wouldn't guess the next one. Anyway, the one I chose to do on my computer was work it out at fifth root infinity. As I already said, there's no problem getting the number. So we're going to again write, uh, you know, so P2 of, remember I was writing zeta n for the standard e of 1 over n. So zeta, fifth, zeta, zeta 5 is here. And then zeta 5 squared is here, here, and here. So here I'm talking about zeta 5 to the power a times e to the minus x. And so what you find with Euler and Maclaurin, so this I won't go through. I, I did it today uh, at zero. But when I talked about Euler and Maclaurin in an earlier thing, we didn't just have the sum f of nt, n from 1 to infinity. But more generally, we had to shift to Euler and Maclaurin with a rational number, which here would be, for instance, uh, you know, two-fifths or something. And then there was a similar form, and you can do it. So that I'm not going to go into. But the result of Euler and Maclaurin, shifted Euler and Maclaurin, is exactly the same. And the same miracle happens that it's terminating. So though you would have had in the exponent, when you take the log, an infinite sum of Bernoulli numbers times, times other Bernoulli numbers. But luckily, it was always two of opposite parities. And so it was a terminating sum. So what you find is, again, a maybe I should write it. The constant should be separate. So it's still square root of x. So that's a little strange. It's as if all of these things had weighed a half. It doesn't matter what x you take. It's always. Uh, square root of x. And then there's always a constant over x, but this constant depends on a mod 5, but it's periodic. So I'll write it's a function of a over 5 modulo 1 over the square root of x. And then again, there'll be an epsilon 2 comma a over 5, so that's my kappa, of x, which is again exponentially small. But here, ca is not such an obvious number. ca over 5 is the following number. It's pi, when you work it out with Euler and Maclaurin. It takes on two values uh, depending whether a is plus or minus 1. It's even. So a is either plus or minus 1 mod 5, or it's plus or minus 2 mod 5, which happens to be quadratic residues and non-residues. It depends on the Legendre symbol. And the actual formula is we still have the z of 3 halves that we had before. Remember, there was a z of 3 halves, or 1 plus 1 over s, times gamma of 3 halves. But gamma of 3 halves is just a half squared of pi. So that's some squared of pi that uh, didn't get, it got lost because I didn't write it. This was squared of pi over 2 squared of 5. So it's 1 fifth z of 3 halves, and then plus or minus, depending whether a is a quadratic residue of 5 or not. So plus in this case and minus in this case. And then it's the value of the L series the Dirichlet series, again, the same Dirichlet series. So, you know, L of S uh, sum over 5, I re remind you, is the sum 
n over 5 n to the minus s, which the Dirichlet series 1 minus 1 over 2 to the s minus 1 over 3 to the s plus 1 over 4 to the s plus 1 over 6 to the s and so on. Okay, so, and, and you can compute that you know, to a thousand decimals. Paris does it instantaneously. You just ask for it, and he gives it. So this constant is known, and again, we know uh, first all orders in x. That's what Orlin McLaurin gives. So this is smaller than any power of x. And now you do the same as before. And so the, kind of the same thing happens, and you find, now we know, remember, the three tricks is first you change variables from x to 2p over, uh, 2 pi over t squared. And then you change, uh, you go at an angle, then you can separate the different terms, and then it's a mess, and you take the log. So when you do all of that, what you find is something that's almost easy to recognize, but not quite. It's the not quite, which, which really was kind of a mess. So now we're taking the log of 1 plus epsilon, and we get is that this is the sum, m from 1 to infinity, and again, this is sum over plus or minus, and then there's a certain coefficient, which you remember before was sigma minus 1 over the square root of m, I think, uh, when kappa was, s is still 2, but kappa is now, you know, a over 5. And then here, there's again a pure exponential and multiple uh, writing mistakes. It's 1 plus or minus i times the square root. Before it was m, now it's the m over the square root of, uh, square root of m over 125. Because remember, I'm looking at this, you know, kappa is a over 5. So that part is fine. You get a pure exponential times the cosine or sine of the same number because it's 1 plus or minus i. So that's very nice. That's good, what you would expect. But this coefficient is really kind of a nuisance. And so I'll just tell you briefly and then give you the final formula. m equals 1. Remember before when m equals 1 was a1. And that was just a single 2 cosine times a single e. Well, here it's the same. So this one, again, is easy to recognize, just as it was before. Now, when you continue, remember before a2, a3, and a4, well, a2 and a3 were very easy. They were just a1 of t squared of 2, a1 of t squared of 3. a4 was a little trickier, but that's only because I hadn't taken the log. If you took the log, it was, well, it was slightly different. The coefficient changed from 1 to 3 halves. But it's very easy. And so m equals uh, 2, 3, and 4 are similar, uh, and therefore, Easy to recognize. After you've recognized that one, you change it a little bit in some very obvious way. But m equals 5 is different. It's not very different. So when you stare at it, you eventually uh, also can be recognized when you look a while. I'll write it in a second. But it's already tricky. So we have, you know, before there was, once I took the log, every term was the same. It was just uh, sigma 1 of 1 over square root of m, just simple numerical coefficients. But now 5. Remember, 5 is special. I'm looking at denominator 5. 5 is now different. But now 6, 7, 8, etc., are like 2, 3, and 4. Well, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And similarly, uh, 10, 15, and 20 are similar. And they're a little different. But once you've recognized 5, it's easy to change things and to guess what you do. So then I thought, I'm done. Now 25, and there are just two kinds of terms. After all, 5 is a prime. But then, unfortunately, f equals 25 is new again. And so when you go beyond 25, and you know, we're talking about exponential things. We're talking about now e to the minus 300. I mean, it's very, very, uh, you know, we have a number of hundreds of decimals because you have to subtract all this stuff, and then what's left is very small. So m is 5 is new again. Then, of course, 26, 27 are like 1 and 2. 30 and 35 are like 5. But indeed, 50 is like uh, 50, 75, and 100 are similar. But then you start worrying because the next one is 125. And now we have something for every power of 5. But luckily, the next one kind of fits the pattern. So it's, you can write a formula which is uniform also for that, but you aren't sure it's true. So if you're me, at least, uh, I only was sure that I was writing down the correct formula when I'd computed these. Once I know this, you can compute each numerical corpus by subtracting the previous and divide it by the next exponential, which is exponentially bigger than the next term, but only if t is very big, which means these things are incredibly small. Sometimes it's like e to the minus 1,800. But you can do it. And then only when I'd gone to 300 was I completely sure you can guess uh, the answer completely. But, uh, and in fact, as I said, 125 
But there was some ambiguity in how you write it, and so it wasn't completely clear. But the formula that worked for 25 then worked for the next few multiples up to uh, 300. I didn't go to 625 because at some point it's silly. And anyway, once you've guessed, the same miracle will happen, and it will become an exact formula. I can already reveal that. So let me give you the final formula. And the final formula is so complicated, I didn't copy it onto paper, so I'll, I'll copy it from my notes. So here's the final, final answer. So the answer, but it's going to be an infinite sum, but then I told you the same surprise, but it's no longer a surprise now. It happens as before, that now it's simply equal, and if I remove all the other stuff, then it's just this log of one plus epsilon two a over five, so remember a was one, two, three, or four of x. This thing is a sum of two terms. Remember, there was a sum over m and a sum of g a, so this is a, remember a is one, two, three, or four mod five. So it's going to be g a of two pi to the three halves times one plus i over the square root of 125 x. And then it's, it's not even or odd in a, but the other term, you take the conjugate here and you take minus a, so it's two pi to the three halves times one minus I, but because of this mixture, that really made it somehow not at all easy to recognize these things. So this is what comes out where, and now I have to define GA of X, so there are already two terms, but GA of X is not just an infinite sum, it's a sum of two quite different uh, infinite sums. And uh, so that's why I needed 300 terms before I could figure out the rule. This is exactly the same as it was before, this is sigma minus one of square root of N, but it's not quite true because here, I have a number A inverse times M. And D, I'll tell you the value of D in a second, it's a, it's a periodic function on the integers with period five. Okay, and I can actually tell you the values. So since it's for integers, here's N and here's D of N. D of zero is minus one, D of plus or minus, remember it's mod five, so there are only five, three values, and it's even. No, it's not even, but d of plus or minus one is the golden ratio, or it's reciprocal, or negative reciprocal, I guess, it's conjugate, and d of plus or minus two is zero. So now I take, but a inverse m makes sense because the argument of a is modulo m, so this one is modulo five. m might not be prime to five, but then I'll get zero, which is minus one, but a is prime to five, so I can invert a modulo five. Uh, and then it's, it's a pure exponential, but it's not e to the minus mx, it's the square root of mx. So that's the main term. And that one is the one that, if they all were the same, would be all the same, but unfortunately it wasn't all like that. And so then there's another term, and that one is, in a sense, even easier, but it's lower order, so it takes more time to find. Now you take a simpler function of a inverse m multiplied, which is just the Legendre symbol. I could also put a m, but it's really a inverse m, and here, there's also something, but now it's sigma minus one of integers, and so you can do that internal sum in closed form. But sorry, no, you can't. It was a double sum, and only when you put it together. So if you expand it out, there are lots of contributions. So this is the final formula. So as x goes, well, I was going to say, as x goes to infinity, when you do the experiments, x is very large, so you can keep the terms apart. But in the end, this just converts for any positive x, or a real part of x positive. And as I say, this is an exact formula. So that's the end of the story. And of course, if you now exponentiate this, it will give you a formula for eta two of tau as tau, uh, tau approaches a over five, but it's a complicated formula. That's the one that I uh, have not written on the board. I only wrote the one as tau approach zero. So next time, I'll talk more about that and finish the discussion of the behavior. Oh, I've actually gone slightly over. So next time will be the behavior of this function. Uh, well, also giving some idea of the proof. The behavior of these functions, p2 and eta, at roots of unit. I've explained how you do it experimentally, but a little more how it works. And then we'll be, we, uh, maybe next time I begin on the circle method, and then the third lecture, we'll be applying all of that to, to p2 to get uh, by the circle method to get information. And that turns out to be full of surprises too that didn't happen in the case of ordinary partitions. So I'm sorry I went slightly over time, but I hope that all this numerics was kind of
fun. I mean, it was an uh, amazingly complicated numerical investigation to get, you know, for instance, this final form experimentally. Really remember this itself, the second sum, so there's a double sum, and then, you know, it's a complete mess. Okay, so then, see you, I hope, some of you, next week. Uh, next week, or next Wednesday, day after tomorrow, in fact, at two. Does anyone have questions? I'm not sure we should have questions, maybe we should have them privately since I'm already over and we shouldn't keep Marco and the others. Sorry? Uh, you can ask that question when I finish talking. So it's not on my website yet. It will be as soon as the course is finished. Uh, I don't want, I spent a lot of time writing the paper and I put everything the best way I know how. So now I'm kind of following the exposition. So if you have it, everybody will be reading and it, uh, or, uh, potentially. So you, you don't get the reference. There is no reference yet. You will get it, uh, but uh, for the moment, you have to listen or wait for another week. Okay, so thank you, and any questions can now be private. <laughs>